Well, we're back. Once more unto Reach. Last week we took a dive into the lesser known memories of Reach, but this week is full force ahead with the next content update. As I'm sure many of you know, this week focuses on the remaining Noble Team armor variants that will be added to the May update. I say remaining as Noble Armor and Decimator can be considered stand-in for Carter's and Noble Six's armors, respectively. We open with a bit of background for these armors. As research and development on Mjolnir Power Assault Armor continues to evolve, many of the suits employed before and during the Fall of Reach saw continual refinement and upgrades as part of the Ordnance Committee's commitment to rapid spiral development. After the development and rollout of the first Gen 2 Mjolnir weapon systems, battle-proven Mark IV and Mark V variants were eventually earmarked for reassessment at the request of veteran Spartan II and Spartan III operatives. Not much else to say, basically some Spartan IIs and threes were nostalgic and the UNSC decided to give them what they wanted. I do find it interesting that they mention the Spartan IIs though, since Blue Team would obviously go on to wear what we see in Halo 5, and Naomi, last we heard, operates with her Mark VII. So, who could they be talking about? I seriously doubt it's Black Team unless these requests were made just before July of 2557 and the Spartans never got to switch to their new armor sets. Maybe another group of Spartans once thought dead? I'd hesitate to say Grey Team since the last time we saw them they were still using early model Mark IV, but who knows. Anyway, onto the armors themselves, starting with George's armor, now called Indomitable. Created to save lives and not take them, the Indomitable is an engineering and explosives ordnance disposal Mjolnir variant. Its combat effectiveness is simply fortuitous. The Indomitable helmet is a rare sight on the battlefield and is usually a sign that the UNSC has authorized weapons of mass destruction. You know, I'll get this out of the way right now, I am not a fan of any of the Noble armors. The colors look way too flat and boring, and in the case of George specifically, the proportions just look wrong. 343 tried to preserve George's bulk and it just does not work out in my opinion. Nevertheless, the name, as is the case for the rest of the Noble Armors, is very fitting. Next up is Emil's, now called Wrath. Formerly an upgrade of existing Mark V EVA suits, the Wrath project was actually a cover to develop a new Mjolnir variant specifically tailored to the needs of future Headhunter teams. The Spartan branch contract for Wrath helmets was extremely precise and prescriptive regarding the pattern and method of reproduction for the Death's Head engraving. In the case of Wrath, what possible reason could the UNSC have to want to keep the skull? It made sense for Emil himself, but as a widely produced armor set, it just seems off-putting. Then again, I'm also not a fan of the Warmaster helmet or the random skull on the orbital armor in Halo 4, so maybe I'm just weird. That said, I really do like the idea of Emil's armor configuration being used for future headhunters. That is definitely fitting of Emil's legacy. After that, we have Cat's armor, now called Intruder. Intruder armor was commissioned by the Spartan branch as part of a research initiative seeking to leverage synergistic outcomes between specialized Mjolnir suits. The Intruder helmet features a full-featured command network module and multi-channel drone controller. The drone controller interfaces directly with Unified Ground Command, Unicom, Killbox Management and Aerospace Deconfliction Systems. As before, not a fan of the general look, but the lore behind it and the name is pretty fitting to Cat's legacy. I'm thinking, and this may just be me, that the bit about the deconfliction systems in the helmet description might actually be a subtle reference to Cat's fate, as deconfliction basically means to reduce the risk of collision. But maybe I'm just reading too much into things. Finally, we have June's armor, which I'm pretty sure is actually June's armor, Vigilant. The Vigilant was originally a one-off upgrade for an unnamed VIP within the Spartan branch. Not intended for production, interest in the suit's feature set among Spartan scout snipers has led to several being assembled for full evaluation. The full extent of the Vigilant's surveillance and stealth capacities remains highly classified. Observers have speculated that the suit includes a new reconnaissance and fire control system for directing orbital artillery strikes. A one-off upgrade for an unnamed VIP. Like I said, I'm pretty sure this is actually June's armor, as in, he asked for a Gen 2 variant of his Mark V armor configuration just for himself. Appearance-wise, same complaints as before. Also, June's sniper bullets now look like nerf darts. Good job, 343. You literally nerfed sniper bullets. Moving forward, we take a look at two special rec weapons coming to Halo 5. First up is George's machine gun, known as, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce this, Etilka, Hungarian for Noble. The modified M247H heavy machine gun fires explosive high capacity rounds while giving the user a speed boost and damage resistance. The second weapon is the Brute Plasma Rifle. These modified rifles were crafted in the Sacred Promissary on high charity for Gerald Hanai forces, specifically at the request of the Prophet of Truth. 
They feature more damage per shot and a higher rate of fire, but at the price of overheating faster. Post-war, newly manufactured brute plasma rifles have been appearing in the hands of mercs and raiders, their source currently unknown. And as we close, what... Wait, what's this? Great Scott! The missing pages from Dr. Halsey's journal detailing a failed experiment to house an AI matrix in slipspace thus allowing for infinite cognitive expansion and the elimination of the problem of rapidity? This is heavy. But in all seriousness, this is genuinely amazing. I cannot properly express how awesome this is. If you recall, last week we discussed Dr. Halsey's journal, a bonus included with the limited and legendary editions of Halo Reach. Well, in that book, there were some missing pages, ripped out by Halsey for reasons mostly unknown. However, in the 17th datapad, it's shown that the Doctor was trying to eliminate rampancy by housing an AI in slipspace where it could grow without restriction. We never knew what happened during that experiment, why it was a failure, and why Dr. Halsey ripped out the pages. Until now. The experiment was both a success and a failure, in ways that really only make sense if you read it yourself. It's some high-level shit, and, more exciting, has some heavy implications for Halo in the wake of Halo 5's story. We'll discuss this more when I do my wrap-up for Halo 5, and in a future video I plan to do. The Cannon Fodder article itself wraps up with a shout-out to the 405th, members of which were recently at the Pacific Coast Championship, and brings us to the new universe entries. This week we have Spartan Emil A239 and Spartan George 052. Emil, like John, was from Eridanus 2. He was born on March 11th, 2523, just over 12 years after John. Kind of funny how similar the two are in terms of birthplace and time. Anyway, Emil's parents were killed by insurrectionists when he was very young, after which he was cared for by his brother on Luxor until the planet was glassed. Emil's brother sacrificed himself so that Emil could escape. In 2531, Emil, along with hundreds of other orphans, were offered the chance to become Spartans. Graduating the program in 2536 at the age of 13, Emil was pulled from the general population for special programs, one of which would eventually be Noble Team. Emil had a loud and flashy attitude and was seemingly sadistic on the battlefield. This was due to his belief that, when facing an enemy bent on your extinction, clinging to one's humanity was as rational as drowning in a pool of your own blood. Emil would do anything everything necessary to win the war. He was a brute not because he enjoyed it, but because he felt he needed to be. I mean, wow, that that really puts Emil in a whole new light, doesn't it? Playing the campaign, as often seems to be the case in these kind of revelations, is never going to be the same. We close today with a look at George, the oddball of Noble not only for his unspartan-like compassion, nor his bulk, but for him being the only Spartan too on the team. George was born on Reach in the small city of Palhaza, which I'm pretty sure I mispronounced again, on March 5th, 2511. As it turns out later in life, George was something of a fatalist, believing he had outlived the span of time allotted to a Spartan, leading him to take on risks he deemed for the good of his unit and the UNSC. Really shines a whole new light on his final actions in Halo Reach, doesn't it? And that does it for today. Hopefully the History of Johnson video should be out during this upcoming week. Thanks for watching, and until next time, this has been... Halo Cannon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you, profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.